Hello and welcome everyone. I am Jen Espinosa Kaswami and as promised I will start doing live stream Fridays every Friday at noon central going forward because I really want to be sure to serve you and while I understand that not all of you are seeing the posts that I'm putting in Wait No More, I do want you to still have access to all the yumminess and amazingness that we're going to be talking about throughout the course of this group. And I encourage you all to join me live on Fridays at noon central. Even if you can't join me live, this video will be playing in the news feed. So make sure you enable notifications so that you can get notifications every time a video pops in. But you can always comment on this video. You can always share your likes, your hearts, everything that's going on with you today. So thank you for joining me. Now, I know some of you have a serious sweet tooth. And the white stuff is very hard to avoid this time of year. So I'd really like to dedicate today's live stream to sugar, sugar. Sugar, sugar, how you get so fly. Sugar, sugar, how you get so fly. Sugar, sugar, how you get so fly. You remember that song by Baby Bash? Um, so I know there's a lot of awareness around sugar these days. And let me tell you something. That's a whole lot of fear mongering, right? I mean, if the health industry is not focusing on one thing, they're always focusing on one thing, right? In the 80s and 90s, it was fat. Don't eat fat. Fat is bad for you. Now it's sugar. Oh, sugar's bad for you. Sugar causes cancer. Sugar is as addictive as cocaine. I mean, there's a lot of fear mongering out there, and I just like to set the story straight here. And again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian or any of that stuff, but I'm a real person just like you. I'm someone who ate a lot of sugar when I was morbidly obese, and I am someone who still eats sugar because I never believe in going cold turkey with anything unless it's something that makes you gag. So um, I have my own opinion on sugar, and as a health coach who works with clients who identify as um, people who struggle with a sweet tooth and struggle with sugar addiction, I would really like to talk a little bit about the true reality of sugar and whether it's something that you need to completely eliminate from your life or if it's something that you can have a um, harmonious relationship with, even if you do create some awareness around sugar. So first of all, you know, it's the holiday season, it's Christmas, we have access to cookies, candies, cocktails, oh my, plenty of that around, right? Oh, if you're joining me for the live stream today, please say hello in the comments so that I can see that you're joining me. I can't always tell when people are joining me, so please say hello, say where you're coming from, I'd love to know if you're here. So let's talk about candy, cookies, and cocktails. They're full of sugar, right? full of sugar. Um, I was making chocolate chip cookies with my mom when I was growing up and I think that recipe, the traditional standard whole house morsel chocolate chip cookie recipe, called for like two whole cups of sugar. Not to mention two sticks of butter and a whole lot of flour. Um, and for many of you who are focusing on their health goals, that's just not going to cut it, right? I mean, you're giving up sugar, you're giving up flour, you're giving up everything but the kitchen sink and you feel deprived. So I do want to encourage you, by no means do you have to completely cut sugar off from your diet. However, you do need to create awareness around when you will allow sugar in your diet and how that sugar will uh, take place. So let's talk about sugar. And I don't mean just the white stuff. I don't mean, you know, sugar substitutes. I don't mean there are many different names for sugar. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. Um, if you're new to reading food labels, you may not be aware that there are up to 30 plus different names for sugar. Um, like it doesn't just say sugar on the back of a food label. It might say cane syrup. It might say brown sugar or molasses. It might say, there's lots of fancy names for sugar. Um, I mean, there are lots of different words for sugar. I can post a little resource about that and we can get into that a little bit more. But the whole purpose of that is creating awareness around your current sugar habits. So again, it's not just what you're creating in your home because I know that many of us are busy and don't necessarily cook all of our meals from scratch. You can always control what you put in your own food, which is why cooking your own food is um, a number one habit to establish when you're trying to improve your health. 
But when you go out to eat a lot or you, um, you buy th you know, semi-processed foods or processed foods from the grocery store, get intimate with those labels. Get intimate with that nutrition information displayed at the restaurant because that will tell you what's in your food. And if the first five ingredients in, on your label or identified in your food are a different word or a synonym for sugar, then you can understand that you're probably consuming more sugar than you need to be. Um, so again, this falls into place more with processed products, with eating out at restaurants. There are a lot of restaurants, especially when they use a lot of sauces, that incorporate a lot of sugar. And sugar comes from natural sources as well. Honey, agave, molasses, maple syrup, stevia. I mean, there are lots of natural sources of sugar too. While natural sources of sugar uh, metabolize in your body differently than white, refined, processed sugar, they still affect your body in a similar way. The only sugars that don't affect your body to the same extent are the, the sugar substitutes. And there is some research that those sugar substitutes, aspartam, aspartame, I, I never know how to pronounce that, aspartame, sucralose, they are somewhat friendly for diabetics sometimes, but that doesn't mean, like these sugar-free foods, it doesn't mean they're good for you. They can actually increase your cravings. So that's a different conversation for a different time. But creating awareness around how much sugar you're digesting currently is a good place for you to start. Whether you identify as having a sweet tooth or not, the more sugar you consume, whether you know you're consuming it or not, the more likely you're going to want more sugar. It's just, it's the way it goes, right? Like the more fat you eat, the more fat you want to eat. Um, fat is a different conversation, but fat is actually good for you. Um, certain sources of fat. Um, so another thing that comes up with my health coaching clients is they say, well, I can't eat fruit because fruit is sugar. And that is true. Fruit has fructose in it, which is sugar. It converts to sugar in your body. But... Fruit is not just fructose. Fruit also has peel and skin and fiber and other things that slow down how your body processes and digests that sugar. So it's not like a sugar crash. Um, it's less work for your body to get through. It's actually more work for your body to get through, which is why it's healthier for you because it takes longer for you to digest and your body benefits from the nutrients that are in the skin and the peel and everything of the fruit. That's why I'm not a big fan of juicing. I'm not a big fan of uh, smoothies and that sort of thing because you puree stuff or you strain it or you remove the hull and the fiber and the bran and the skin and the peel and those things are actually beneficial to you. So a whole food diet obviously is the best route to go, but that doesn't mean that you need to eliminate all fruit from your diet. When it comes to fruit though, I would caution you to uh, stay very weary of dried fruits. This time of year we have a lot of cranberries, we have a lot of um, raisins, we have dates, we have a lot of dried fruits. Uh, even if you go to your neighborhood Costco, there's you know dried blueberries, dried cherries, and those are tasty and wonderful and amazing but a serving size of dried fruit could be a fourth a cup or half a cup. It's, it's much smaller than a whole piece of fruit. And when you dry the fruit, you concentrate the source of sugar in it. So your body has, um, your body treats it more like a candy bar, basically. So obviously you know you're not supposed to eat candy bars, but you also know you're not supposed to eat most of your sources of fruit from dried fruits because it's high in sugar. It's one thing you should be aware of. A lot of granola incorporates dried fruits. A lot of those fruits have not just the, the natural sweetness and fructose from the fruit, but they also might be coated in something that is additional sugar. So something for you to be aware of. Uh, dried fruits are perhaps not as healthy in terms of sugar as whole fruits, like a, an orange or an apple. So now that you created awareness around what's in your food and um, how many sources of sugar, and I will post a little a little infographic about different names for sugar because there are literally hundreds of them. It's amazing. These food manufacturers are quite clever and quite sneaky in their methods. Now that you've created awareness around how much sugar you're eating today, you have a choice. Do you go cold turkey? Or do you decide to wean yourself or moderate? I can't tell you what the answer is for you. I can tell you that I had an amazing food memory from when I was on my weight loss journey of 100 pounds. This was 18 years ago. So I 
the first month I started my weight loss journey, I'm like, okay, well, I'm creating awareness. I'm writing down what I'm eating. I'm looking at food labels. This is awesome. I also made a determination to not eat dessert because I realized that I was eating dessert after every meal. And that sometimes included breakfast too. I, I'm a little embarrassed to admit, but it's true. It's 100% true. So I would eat a lot of dessert. So I decided, well, that first month when I started my weight loss journey, I will not eat dessert. And I'm not a big fan of fruit. So for me, fruit is not really dessert. Fruit is not a snack. Fruit, fruit doesn't play very heavily into my life. And I didn't drink juice at the time because I was only drinking water and coffee. So, you know, this was a good route for me to go. I was basically weaning myself off of sugar. However, I was taking the cold turkey approach. I never intended for that to be a lifelong approach, though. So when you think about whether you should go cold turkey for yourself, is it something that you're doing temporarily to challenge yourself or to see what you're made of or if you can do it or whatever? Is it intended to be a short-term challenge? Or is it intended to be a long-term lifestyle change? I would say that for me, it never would have been more than a short-term thing. But the food memory that that created for me, so I had no dessert for a month. And the following month, I'm like, okay, it's time to eat a dessert. So I went for the mother of all desserts. It was called an Offering to the Goddess. And it truly was an Offering to the Goddess. I am not kidding you. It was like this beautiful fondue, chocolate fondue fountain with bananas and graham crackers and marshmallows that I could dip in my chocolate fondue with a little flame at the top so I could roast my marshmallows. I mean, it was amazing. It was like a dessert you've, you've dreamed of. And this was after no, a month of no desserts. And that was one of my strongest food memories is going back to eating dessert after a month away. So short term has its benefits as long as you understand your intent behind it. So you can go cold turkey, but if you go cold turkey, I encourage you to set limits around that and to set the intention for how long are you going to go cold turkey and be very specific. So for me, it was no desserts. It didn't mean I was eating food that had no sugar in it. That's a very extreme challenge to do. You may have heard about that family that went sugar-free for an entire year, and they literally would not eat any food that had added sugar to it. And just about every food you buy in the grocery store that's not a whole food has sugar added to it. Even scalloped potatoes have sugar added to them. So that is a huge, extreme challenge, especially if you have kids who... Um, are a little too attached to their sugar sources. So I don't encourage that. I mean, that family, God bless them, and they're still, from what I understand, on pretty much a sugar-free lifestyle, but that doesn't apply to the majority of people. Just being honest here, the majority of us are not going to be able to avoid sugar for the rest of our lives. And there's some biology behind that. So I'm going to take a little aside here. When we're babies, if we're nursing from our moms, our moms are breastfeeding us, breast milk is composed of sugar and fat. We have a biological predisposition to enjoy sugar and fat. So knowing your biology and knowing the fact that our environment is filled with sugar, do you honestly believe that it's a lifetime thing for you to avoid sugar? And if it's not, then let's talk about moderation. Oh, I love moderation. I'm all about moderation. So Moderation, how does that play into your life? Well, we talked about creating awareness. So once you've created awareness around how much sugar you're actually eating, how then do you decide to moderate it? Again, this is a very personal question and it'll be different for everyone. For me, I decided to make more food at home. I decided to only pick up food labels that did not have a source of sugar in the first 10 ingredients. I decided to... Um, to not eat dessert after lunch, to eat non-sweetened nuts, to eat unsweetened yogurt. Um, so I became very savvy to reading food labels, and I also became very savvy to making food at home that still tasted good to me but had less sugar. And I have a whole article that I wrote about healthy baking because, you know, it is the time of year when the baking comes out and the cookies come out. And whenever I pick up a recipe, I'm all over Pinterest. So if you, <laughs> pop a comment in here if you want to follow me on Pinterest. I have thousands of beautiful pins all around healthy food, exercise out of the gym, um, motivation, everything you need to know. So if you're interested in following me on Pinterest, this is your day. 
<laughs> but no, what I was trying to say was whenever I take a new recipe off of Pinterest or from a friend or whatever, I, I first do the recipe as is because I want to make sure I'm doing it right, right? That the product ends up being somewhat like I expected it to turn out. And then, then the fun begins because from there I'm like, okay, here's what I liked. Here's what I didn't like. My kids ate it. My kids didn't eat it. My husband ate it, whatever. It was a lot of mess. How much cleaning did I have to do? I evaluate. I'm like, okay, is this a good recipe or not? And then I look at it again with a more critical eye. And I'm like, okay, let's start st substituting stuff. So if it calls for a cup of sugar, did I really need that full cup of sugar? Or was it a little sweet? Maybe I'll half the amount of sugar I put in it. So I'll move it down from one cup of sugar to half a cup of sugar. Easy peasy. And really, if you reduce the amount of sugar you're using by half, you will notice a difference, but it will not be a huge, like making it inedible kind of difference. It will be seamless. It will uh, probably not be noticed by your children, by your partner, by anyone, but you, because you're the one who made it, right? So I'm not saying you should keep secrets, but you shouldn't be like, oh yeah, I this is sugar free or this is reduced sugar. You don't have to tell everyone what you're up to. Just put it in front of them, see if they like it, see if you like it, and then establish that recipe as your own with your own substitutions. Um, and what I tend to do also, if I'm baking something, what I'll do is I'll replace white sugar with other forms of sugar. The natural sugars I referred to earlier, honey. I don't use agave because I don't like the taste of it, but honey, pure maple syrup, Sometimes I'll use applesauce, sweet potato puree, uh, whatever I have on hand that will make it sweet. Uh, there are lots of things that will make it sweet. Date paste. Um, there are lots of things that make baked goods sweet without using white table sugar. And again, when you're starting off with changing recipes and doing that sort of thing, it's very important for you to do it slowly and replace and substitute like a half and half kind of way. So you can reduce the amount of sugar in your own cooking and take control of those recipes and play with them. Life is about fun and enjoyment, right? You don't have to be like, I can't do this. I can't eat this. This is horrible. I, I hate my life. No, you, can, you have control over your life. You have control over what you're eating. You have control over what you're creating. What do you want to create? Um, and the, Okay, so moderation. We talked about cookies and candies and all that sort of thing. Candy. Let's talk about candy. Obviously, candy's not good for you, right? Some candies are worse for you than others. I'm not going to get into the whole debate of or, or which candies have fewer calories and how long it takes you to burn it off and all that crap. I don't care. I really don't care. You are the one who sets the guidelines for whether you accept candy in your life or whether you don't. I will say that the darker and richer your chocolate is, the more benefits you get from it from a nutrition standpoint. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go organic and fair trade, which tends to be very expensive. But if you're doing, if you're eating a chocolate bar from, uh, that's 75% source from cacao, as opposed to a Hershey bar, there are more flavanols and nutrients in that cacao bar than in Hershey. So sorry, Hershey, you have a lot of wax in your chocolate. You know, so there are healthier sources of candy. I'm not saying they're not. But a thing to be aware of is um, candy that's labeled as organic doesn't necessarily mean it's healthy. Candy that's labeled as GM, non-GMO doesn't necessarily mean healthy. So again, it's all about setting those guidelines and those expectations. If you allow candy in your life, awesome. Chocolate is actually good for you. There are certain candies that are good for you. You can make your own gummies that include things that help you battle flus and colds. I mean, there are lots of options for you. You don't have to go cold turkey with candy. But set those guidelines and those expectations. Okay, if you're going to have chocolate, more power to you. I have chocolate all the time. Uh, set your expectations. Okay, how often are you going to allow yourself to have chocolate? Is, are you going to allow yourself to have chocolate when you're emotional? There are pros and cons to that. But, you know, if you're an emotional eater and you say, whenever I'm feeling emotional, I'm going to allow myself chocolate. Well, that may not be setting you up for success. So you decide, is candy worth it to you? For me, it is. There are some times of year when I'm like, I need some gummy worms. That's my travel food. I love gummy worms. That doesn't mean I'm going to go buy a whole bag and eat the whole thing. But once in a while, like this past year, my, my father passed away and I was driving by myself on a seven hour drive. I was crying. I was very emotional. I was scared. I wasn't sure what was going on. I'm like, okay, I'm going to buy myself a bag of gummy worms. 
I'm not saying that that was the healthiest thing for me at the time, but that was what I needed. That was a way for me to self-soothe without feeling like I was completely sabotaging myself. I mean, it was a bag of gummy worms. It's not going to sabotage my whole week. And I was at a very low emotional standpoint, and I, I accepted that. I accepted where I was, and I accepted the consequences of, of what my actions were. So, again, set your guidelines for candy. Now, for the next 10 minutes, we're going to talk about something that many of you may be resonating with. Cocktails. It's the holiday season. We've got New Year's Eve coming up. Are you going to kiss your sweet ones? Are you going to drink all night long? We have happy hours after work. It's Friday night. It's time to party. You know, it's happy hours somewhere. Do you like to drink? Nothing wrong with drinking. Nothing wrong with drinking. However, if you drink more often than you don't, then those calories are adding up. And again, I'm a health coach who does not focus on calories necessarily, but what does alcohol give you that's beneficial? Not a whole lot. It's full of sugar, and it's full of other things that cause your gut to inflame and you to get bloated. If you're mixing like Captain and Coke or other sources of sugar, it's hitting your bloodstream faster than it would if it's just straight up liquor, hard liquor. So being aware of the sugar you're getting in your cocktails, most cocktails are full of sugar. Wine is full of sugar. I mean, even the dry, you know, woody wines, they do have sugar. It's, it's from grapes. Grapes are full of sugar. So, you know, most of those things are full of sugar. Even a beer that doesn't taste particularly sweet, it's fermented grain. It, it is sweet. You know, grain is, has sweetness in it, has sugar in it, and that's where the flavor from the beer comes from. So you choose your poison, but I do encourage you, if you're going to go and drink, again, set your expectations. And I help people wean off of their drinking habits. I mean, I had a client who was, at, was fine with her weight. It wasn't about weight for her, but she had a particular challenge with drinking in the evening. You know, a couple of Captain and Cokes, and she was feeling good, she was, but she was basically stressed and she wasn't getting enough sleep. And it was kind of her way of winding down. So we helped work with her to establish um, some other healthier habits and to help wean her off the alcohol. Now, again, if it feels like a problem for you, it is a problem. If it doesn't feel like a problem for you, it may not be a problem. If people are telling you it's a problem and it doesn't feel like a problem, you might want to question yourself. But if it doesn't feel like a problem for you, it's not a problem. Alcohol. <laughs> Excuse me. I drink about once or twice a month. I haven't been drunk since 2000. If you drink enough servings of alcohol that you're drunk, at least once a week, then you might want to consider weaning yourself off. And here is my number one technique for doing that. Um, again, I'm not an alcohol counselor. I, I'm not a psychologist. I, I'm not here to tell you if you have a problem with alcohol. I am saying that the more alcohol you drink, the more sugar you're consuming, and that's not going to help you with your health. And there are very few nutritional benefits to alcohol. Wine does have some, depending on what kind of wine you have, but that's not the whole thing. Oh, drink a glass of wine instead of exercising. That's, that's bogus. You're not going to get any fit benefits from drinking wine. So weaning yourself off, uh, off of alcohol whether you're drinking less frequently or drinking fewer servings per time you do drink. Here's my number one tip for that. So you go to a party, right? And what does the host do? They bring you a drink. Is it going to be several hours before you're going to eat? If it is, I would consider asking for a glass of water first. Because the more you hydrate, the less likely you're going to consume a lot of alcohol. Plus, the more you hydrate, the less you're going to eat when it actually comes time to sit down and eat. Um, that's to start off. Make sure you drink water first. First, first, first for water. Yes, yes, yes. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. And then if you decide to have a cup of whatever they're offering, wonderful. Do not drink a cup or a glass or whatever with your food. Now, there's research behind this. I won't get into that too much. But if you drink while you're eating, for one, you're not paying attention to the calories from what you're drinking which is why restaurants do bottomless drinks, because you eat more when you have bottomless Coke, you tend to eat more food. It's, it's a tactic. They, they know their buyer habits. Um, so if you drink while you're eating food, you actually um, are setting yourself up to eat more food, in a nutshell. Um, so if you want to have alcohol after that, that's fine. But in between each serving of alcohol, have a full glass of water. 
there's only so much liquid you can drink in an evening, right? So if you're drinking a full glass of water in between each serving of alcohol, guess what? You're not going to get as big a hangover. You're not going to drink as much liquor. Win-win, right? And you're going to be in the potty most of the time, so you won't be eating or drinking while you're in the potty. <laughs> That's my tip for weaning off of alcohol. So you may be invited to a bunch of holiday parties, and alcohol is always there, right? I mean, that's what adults do. We drink our adult Kool-Aid, and we go and we have a good time. You don't need to drink to have a good time. Yeah, you, you don't. You can, if that's what you choose to do. But again, set the expectation. If you're going to go to a party, and you know it's going to be unlimited bar, and you're like, ooh, I love this, and I love that, and I love this, choose your poison. <laughs> Not literally. Choose your drink of choice, and stick to one or two. Drink your water in between. Don't drink while you're eating. And when you're done with your glass, give it away. Don't keep it in your hand because someone will come around and refill you. Give away your glass. Those are my tips for weaning off of that. So today's live stream has been all about sugar. Sugar, sugar, how you get so fly. Sugar, sugar, how you get so fly. You do not need to go cold turkey. If you do, set, set a time limit on that. Is that forever? Is that a month? Is that three weeks? Um, there are plenty of challenge groups out there where you can do the sugar-free challenge, all that sort of thing. Um, when you're talking about sugar, you need to create awareness around what you're doing. Look at your labels, look at the nutrition guidelines for the restaurant you're going to, and just become aware of it. Write it down, uh, pay attention to it before you consume it, that sort of thing. Identify the different sources of sugar, the different names and aliases for sugar. I'll post a link for that in, in the comments down here. And then we talked about Candy, which, again, you set your guidelines. Are you going to allow it? How many times are you going to allow it? Under what situations will you allow it? If you're an emotional eater, I would not encourage you to allow it every time you're emotional. It's not going to set you up for success. And then we talked about cocktails. Cocktails are plain sugar. Even if a beer, wine, alcohol, I don't care what you're drinking, it's pure sugar. And it doesn't really benefit you in any sense. But if you choose to indulge, that's fine. And make sure you hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Make sure you don't drink while you eat. And make sure that you set expectations around how much you can drink when you're drinking. Those are my tips for you to enjoy sugar, sugar during the holiday season. If you have any questions for me or want to establish uh, what sugar, what role sugar will have in your life going forward, I'd love to have a conversation with you because it can be very difficult to set certain expectations. Maybe you're like, I'm not sure what I can do. I haven't tried before. I'm a little nervous about what this may mean for me. I really don't know all these different sources of sugar or how one is more beneficial than the other. I'd love to have a conversation with you. Comment on this video and I will connect with you and we will figure it out for you. We'll figure out what your life looks like. Is it going to be a sugar-free life? Is it going to be a moderated sugar life? Is it going to be you cooking more or just creating awareness? And I can help you understand how you can create awareness around that. That's what I do. I'm a health coach. I want you to feel amazing in your own body. And the only way you can do that is by getting the type of support you need at the time you need it. So thank you for joining me today for our conversation on sugar. This video will be playing throughout the weekend, so please let me know your comments. Connect with me for a phone call. Look at the resource I'll post for you about different names for sugar because there are lots of them out there. And most of all, have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. I enjoyed your time today, and thank you for joining me. This is Jenna Spinoza-Kaswami. Talk soon.